I deliberately chose a somewhat opaque title. Uh, that, won't, that won't really be clear to you till the, to the end of the talk. Um, and really, um, in the, the spirit of, uh, of, of trying to tell you something interesting, I'm going to try to show you a problem that I've been struggling with for about the past five years and, um, and how we're thinking about it and, and why I think it's important um, to, um, to understand not just TB disease, but TB um, chemotherapy. And those of you who know me know I'm a druggie, um, and I, I say that very proudly. Um, I just do TB drugs, and um, I'm not going to really think or talk too much about the uh, application of the kinds of things we're seeing uh, in animals and in, in human studies. Um, to other areas of TB, but I do think that the kinds of things that we're looking at now are important for other aspects of the disease as well. And so in the, the spirit of, being, um, of living up to that um, designation as a druggie, I'm going to start by telling you how we got to where we are with uh, TB chemotherapy in brief, and then try to illustrate how we're trying to reinvent that system to get to where we want uh, to be. So this is, uh, this is actual results um, from the first uh, clinical trial uh, for tuberculosis treatment that was ever performed. Um, this was a clinical trial of streptomycin um, added to patients with uh, active, acute, uh, progressive bilateral disease who were considered unsuitable for collapse therapy. Collapse therapy. So collapse therapy was the sort of standard of the day, right? I mean, the, the way you cured TB was you went in and punctured someone's lung and, and collapsed it so that you debulked uh, the disease and slowed the growth of the organism. And if you were unsuitable for that, um, you didn't have a very good prognosis. As you can see, the, the y-axis there is percentage of people who are still alive. And so 40% of the control group um, were still alive two years after they were enrolled in this study. Um, and they added, this, was, this is widely credited as a milestone in modern medicine because it's the first ever published randomized controlled trial. It was the first real randomized placebo controlled trial. They didn't do that because they were really foresighted about the way we were going to do clinical trials in the future. They only had a certain amount of streptomycin. And so they wanted to give patients who were eligible for this trial equal chance to get streptomycin or not get streptomycin. This was a trial that was limited by how much drug they actually had uh, present at the time. And they could only give drug for about three months. And what you see is that giving the drug um, didn't really have a, a ginormous impact on how patients did long term on treatment. Most of the people who had TB and were progressively acute bilateral um, disease died in that period of time. So that was the state of uh, where we were. And one other important aspect of that trial was that at one year um, after the, the treatment period was, uh, was initiated, almost all, 37 of 42 um, streptomycin-treated patients had streptomycin-resistant bacteria present in their sputum. So that's 90%. Um, the remaining patients mostly had died, um, or they didn't. there was one patient where they didn't have bacterial isolates. And so that's another important uh, principle of TB chemotherapy that, or a finding that really underlies our principle today of giving combination therapy, because we believe the treatment with monotherapy always results in resistant bacteria selected within the patients. Okay, so without giving you too much more um, historical uh, data, I do want to just point out one more aspect of how we got to where we are, and that's a series of um, clinical trials that was run by the British Medical Research Council um, really uh, over a 40-year period. As these medicines emerged onto the, as new chemotherapies emerged onto the horizon, there were seven that were developed in that period of time. Um, they ran uh, these uh, 200 different trials in over 25,000 patients um, in developing countries, mostly in East Africa and some in Asia. And there's the list of drugs that they evaluated. And through a strictly kind of empirical process of trial and error for different initiation regimens and continuation regimens, they ended up developing what we call ultra-short course chemotherapy today, which is the two-month combination of four drugs, INH, rifampicin, pyrazidin, and ethambutol, and the four-month combination of two drugs, isoniazid and rifampicin, that we use to cure um, TB patients today. Now this was, again, it was a strictly um, empirical way of looking at how you do drug development. And the outcome they were interested in was disease relapse. And so how many of these patients, two years after they stopped taking drugs, were, were consistently sputum culture negative and had actually achieved a cure of that um, disease? And so this is kind of one of the misconceptions, I think, of, of TB chemotherapy. 
not every patient needs six months of treatment to achieve a cure, to achieve remission of the disease. In fact, um, Wallace Fox, who was the, the leader of the BMRC uh, clinical unit, um, who died a few years ago, realized and said openly, you know, the vast majority of TB patients are cured adequately with four months, and some are even cured with three months of chemotherapy. We just don't know who they are. And so we're gonna treat everybody for six months because some patients need six months, but many patients, the majority of patients, are cured by four months and some are even cured by three months. And so um, that was sort of lost, I think, in the dustbin of history when uh, modern people, when we sort of rediscovered TB in the mid-1980s and the early 1990s, and our interpretation of the way that those trials were done and the need for six months of chemotherapy really became um, the, the purview of the microbiology community. And I say this as a proud member of that community occasionally, um, uh, although I think, as you'll see, I think it's more complicated than just the microbiology. And so we became accustomed to graphs like this that show this idea that there's a rapid sterilizing, uh, a rapid early uh, kill of bacteria, but then the bacteria become resistant uh, to treatment. And so you have to continue to treat people for a very long time because those bacteria are persistent or phenotypically tolerant or substitute in your favorite word for that. And I think um, the, the, at least by the end of this talk, I hope you'll appreciate this is at least a viable alternate hypothesis, is that it's not just the bacteria that change in that period of time, it's actually the host and particularly the host pathology that changes over that period of time. And so instead of thinking this, of this strictly from a microbiology perspective, you really have to start to understand some of the pathology and some of the disease natural history to think about how we're going to do anything better than what we do currently with um, six month ultra short course chemotherapy. And this became particularly acute and I think um, underlie a lot of the recent uh, focus changes at the Gates Foundation because we saw not only big failures of vaccine trials that you're probably aware of, but perhaps less, you're less aware of big failures in the drug space um, when we tried to shorten therapy to four months by addition of a fluoroquinolone uh, and replacing one of the other less active agents. And three very large uh, phase three studies profoundly showed um, and quite convincingly showed that that was not effective in shortening a therapy in patients uh, to three months. And so that was about 6,000 patients enrolled in those phase three studies at a huge expense and a huge uh, undertaking. And that was like a nuclear bomb went off in the TB drug development space, right? Everything, every model we had, every in vitro model of persistence, every in vivo model of you know, simple disease, uh, mouse disease, suggested this should have been adequate to treat patients uh, for four months, and yet it clearly wasn't. So we had no idea what we were doing. <clears throat> I think the lesson that I learned from those trials, and I think um, is underappreciated, is that really um, looking just at the sputum was not going to give you the answer for how long you needed to treat patients. And you, don't, you don't need to pay too much attention. Just look at the three graphs on the right-hand side. This is a reanalysis of the data from the REMOX trial um, by Steve Gillespie and Patrick Phillips that shows three different measurements on the y-axis of culture conversion. Okay, so all three of those are just three different ways. You know, one's LJ, one's midget, and one's time to positivity, the slope of the decline of the, um, the CFUs in the sputum. And you can see that the, the green and the red dots, which represent um, the comparisons of ethambutol versus control and the isoniazid versus control are identical. So the culture conversion rates are identical in those two, um, those two lines, despite the fact that the relapse rates are statistically different. So there's very different, different relapse rates despite identical culture conversion rates. And what that means is that what you're sampling in the culture, in, that, in this case from the sputum, is not telling you what's causing relapse in patients long term. Okay, so I'm gonna tell you about um, two, different way, two different modalities, and I suspect most of you have heard this before, two different ways of looking at TB patients on chemotherapy using uh, imaging methods. And the two imaging methods I'm gonna talk about, just to bring everybody to the same page, are computed tomography, which is just high-intensity x-rays. Um, and I'll show you some examples of this in just a second. The opacity to x-rays, or the radio density of a, of a feature in your body is referred to, measured in a scale called Hounsfeld units, and I'll talk about that in just a second. And it's often called structural imaging, because you're just getting a picture of what structures are present in the lungs. 
In contrast, um, positron emission tomography uses a radioactive probe. And today, I'll, all I'll, I'll talk about is the probe that's up there, which is commonly used in oncology, and it's just the derivative of glucose. It's a fluorinated derivative of glucose, so it can't, uh, can't be metabolized uh, in cells. It can be phosphorylated, and so it's trapped in cells that are burning glucose actively, and so we use this as a proxy of inflammation. And so this is just neutrophils, macrophages, dendritic cells, anything that's burning a lot of glucose takes this probe up, phosphorylates it, locks it in the cell, and you get a picture of it um, in a PET camera. And that's often called functional imaging, although the function is you know, kind of loosely just, I like glucose, right? So you have to be careful how you interpret these things. <clears throat> and so um, we have, for about the past 10 years, been using that probe in looking at patient response uh, to TB chemotherapy. And I, I'm not going to go through a lot of the details. This is just to show you one example of that. This is a patient with multidrug resistant tuberculosis, um, restricted to um, the right lower lobe, and if I cut away the left lobe and spin the right lobe around, you can see what happens below that in the bottom left. Um, and then after two months of treatment with five effective drugs, that patient has had some response in terms of the PET CT signal. Now, the PET you're seeing there is in orange, and that's reflecting the radioactivity that's coming off from met metabolism of that glucose. And then the brown gray um, stuff is the CT density, which is showing you how much pathology is present at that site of disease. And so you see there are changes at two months, and you, know, you can look at it at an overall level and say, yeah, it looks like that patient's getting better or that disease is going away. Um, but if you look at specific features in that, and that's what we're going to spend the rest of the talk talking about, um, there are specific features that don't really respond. And so some things do respond and some things don't respond. And so what's, what's really going on with that? So the first level of description, and this has been borne out in other cohorts now, is that PET-CT and looking functionally at what's happening in the lungs is a pretty good indicator of how patients are going to do uh, on chemotherapy. And so the two rock curves at the top there are just showing different measures of the radiology. And if you just look at the table, you can see that PET um, at two months um, is 96% uh, sensitive and 75% specific for predicting the outcome of that patient two and a half years later, right? So did they cure or did they not cure their MDR disease two and a half years later? And if you don't think 96% sensitive and 75% specific looks very good, look at the culture and the smear results at the bottom, and you'll see why we were excited, because culture is only about 79% sensitive and 50% specific in determining that same outcome. So we were clearly doing much better than we could do, do just at a bulk level, even uh, in, in just simply diagnosing how patients uh, do. OK, so let me show you what this data looks like in real, um, real terms. And so, if this movie cooperates, yeah, this is a reconstruction of the bronchial tree of a patient with uh, drug-sensitive uh, tuberculosis, just showing you the different bronchopulmonary segments in the lung. I'm going to build in um, the aorta, <clears throat> and then I'm going to build in the vasculature that's present in the lungs. So remember, lungs just exchange blood uh, gas, right? So they're looking to put blood and air in the same place. And now I'm going to show you where the TB disease is. And you see it's, it's integrally woven in amongst those, those branches. And the white at the middle is a cavity. That's an air pocket inside a, a focus of necrosis in this patient with, uh, with pulmonary disease. So let me freeze frame that now for you. So you've seen what it looks like in 3D. And the yellow represents the air in the center of this. And the black represents all the voxels that contain uh, abnormal density that you wouldn't normally find in the lung. And the, the diagram on the right um, shows you what that patient looks like after getting two months of curative intensive phase for drug therapy. So remember, this is a patient with drug sensitive disease um, who's getting treated with appropriate therapy um, every day because they're in the hospital being watched while they're, while they're taking it. And now you can start to see the level of detail we can, we can impose on these uh, constraints because now we can count every voxel, right? So I can talk to you about how many milliliters of disease that they have with these kinds of features, how many milliliters of air was present in that cavity, and how did it change on this particular drug regimen? And that becomes a powerful quantitative way to assess the pathology as opposed to just looking at what's present in the sputum and the bacteriology. OK, the other part of this story that you need to, um, to understand to uh, appreciate where we're going with this is um, the animal models that are developed to support this. And so 
uh, quite a number of years ago now, um, Joanne Flynn and I, um, actually having seen the results in patients, um, thought we really need to build this in an animal system so we could understand what was happening in, in the patients. And so we approached um, the foundation and NIH uh, intramural to support that and built a PET CT scanner so we could look at a relevant uh, animal model. In this case, I'm using a common marmosets. Um, Joanne uses synomologous macaques, and we've done a lot of this work uh, together over the years. Why common marmosets? Um, common marmosets are new world uh, monkeys. Um, the key attribute um, for me, um, since I'm properly uh, a, car a card carrying chemist, is you only need about three grams of a compound to do a study in a common marmoset, as opposed to 30 grams that you need to do in a synomologous macaque, which is not so easy to make. So we infect these animals by low-dose aerosol, um, typically with um, between 10 and 20 organisms of M. tuberculosis. They develop disease, and I'll show you an example of that um, in just a second. They contain the disease to some extent uh, if you don't treat them at all, and we let them develop disease for a certain period of time, and then we'll initiate treatment and look at the treatment responses. Now, of course, the, the reason you want to do this in, in a monkey is so that you can draw parallels with what you're seeing in the monkey and what we're seeing in the humans. And so um, the first thing we did with the, with the monkeys in this model was essentially benchmark it to normal disease. And so this is an animal who 40 days post-infection has um, the, uh, the picture shown on the leftmost side with the bright orange spots. Um, that's FDG uptake in uh, TB lesions uh, 40 days post-infection before he's treated. And then he's treated with four drugs, uh, the same four drugs patients get at roughly the same uh, pharmacodynamic window. So we try to match the PK as well as we can. And you can see there's a rapid response to those four drugs. And um, before I show you any of the, the sort of detailed results of that, I should point out that um, the, mo the monkeys are not a small undertaking, right? There's quite a number of people, and I've shown four of the veterinarians and, and associated people who make this happen on a regular basis in our lab um, at the top there, if, in case I forget to credit them later on. Okay, so I believe I have to come out of this. And let me show you what uh, this actually looks like in terms of the data. So these are just the slices that comprise the CT scans that, uh, that you get as a readout from the CT uh, functionality of that. Now what you can do with those, um, using a, a lot of software that we've benefited uh, from the, the, the NCI group that does um, quantitative imaging assessment, is you can rebuild all the physiological structures out of that um, series of PET CT scans. So what I'm going to do is just pull out the bones, pull out the bronchus and the sub uh, branches of that, and then I'm going to label each of the TB lesions a different color, right? Of, of course, it's not a color CT scanner. We can't afford one of those, but it's, um, they're, they're just artificial colors to indicate they're different lesions over time. Okay, so let me show you. Now, sorry, that movie won't play within the... Let me show you one example of the, the sort of what I would view as my major headache over the last five years. If you look at animals, at individual animals, in one single animal, you can find examples of lesions that, like the one on the upper, um, upper two slides, this is the lesion prior to treatment, so this is about six weeks after the animal's been infected. This is a single lesion uh, here, and this is after uh, two months of treatment with, in this case, it's linazolid, but it, the drug actually doesn't matter very much um, here. And you can see this lesion has largely resolved in that period of time. The same animal, just slightly farther up in the lungs, this green uh, lesion here, this lesion doesn't really respond at all in that same period of time. Okay, so that's two lesions, right? Here's what happens if you're really fanatical about this and you go through and you measure every single lesion at every single time you, you scan the animal. So here's 30 days after infection, you can just barely start to define some of the lesions. He's not being treated. Here's 45 days after infection. I've highlighted, remember this is one animal. He has 16 definable lesions. Here's 55 days. This is the point when we're gonna impose treatment, but you can see some lesions are already starting to change. And then we start treating the animal, and some of those lesions respond, and some of those lesions don't. 
So just think about that for a second. This is within a single animal, right? This is not PK. This is not like there's a different level of exposure to the drug. This is something fundamental about the lesions that responds to treatment with this drug in a particularly different way. Um, and so, um, so the graph looks a little bit complicated. Um, and so what, you're, what I'm showing you on that y-axis is the maximum amount of radioactivity. So this is the maximum amount of inflammation. But the size of the balls is actually the total volume that's present within that lesion. OK, so those two things aren't correlated with each other, necessarily. So the pathology and the inflammation are responding differently, are different in those, in those lesions. And some of those lesions are clearly responding, right? They're almost completely gone by the time we've treated that animal with eight weeks of linazolid therapy. And some of those lesions are actually getting worse, both in size and in, infl in, in inflammatory status in that period of time, within one animal. So let's drill down on that. So here are the lesions that um, respond, I'll call it pattern of response one. They start here. Um, they're clearly going up before the animal is treated. They're being contained because the amount of radioactivity, the total inflammation is decreasing. And then linazolid hits them, and they're extinguished um, from the animal. So that's one pattern of response. Here's the other pattern of response. Um, these lesions start out again here. Um, they're going up and coming down because this is a sort of typical across m multiple animal species, including mice and rabbits. You see a peak of inflammatory response, then the animal starts to get on top of it, and the lesions start to control themselves. And then you impose linazolid treatment on them, and those lesions are still not responding at all. Right? Everybody's with me. This is one animal. Right? I'm just breaking the lesions apart into different kinds of lesions. OK, don't pay any attention to the pictures on the side. We'll come to that in just a second. And here's the third pattern, the, the lesion that stands out that doesn't really fit. And this lesion's absent when the animal uh, at day 30, and it's absent 45 days later. But it becomes the dominant feature in the animal um, at, while the animal is actually on treatment. So after two weeks, but then it responds, and it's completely gone at the end. And this is, a, this is fun, functionally a different kind of lesion. This is actually a consolidation. It's not a necrotic center like we see typically with tuberculomas. But this is what they call a consolidation, where you can see the bronchi. You can see an air bronchogram in the center of it. And this is a different, we see this in patients all the time, too. So it's just, just to highlight, there are different flavors of lesions, and they have very different kinds of responses um, to chemotherapy. And so I'll break that down a little bit further. So on the lesions on the left side are the lesions that showed a clear response to chemotherapy. So that's pattern of response one, if you remember the slide two slides ago. And on the right slide is the lesions that showed no response to therapy. And what I've done is paste on the number of CFUs that are present when we take those lesions and plate them and ask how many bacteria are still present. And what you can see is that the, most of the lesions on the left that were responding to treatment are sterile and have no bacteria or very few bacteria, and most of the lesions on the right that weren't responding have large numbers of bacteria. So it's not just the inflammatory signal, it's actually representing what's present in terms of the bacterial numbers that are present in, that, in those samples. So what's different about those lesions? Well, why, why does this actually um, show such a profound difference in these kinds of responses? And to answer that, um, we really had to um, turn to a um, uh, Turn to the histopathology, which um, uh, at least Gilla will remember, and many other of uh, my group have had great fun pointing out that I used to, smir to, to smirk at the, the, uh, the histopathology and say, well, that's just descriptive science, right? You can't really answer any real questions with that. What we had to learn how to do was essentially to take histopathology sections, and I've completely changed my mind on that, by the way. Um, take, take the histopathology sections and then trace out where the blood vessels are and where the airways are within those and then create a 2D mask of that and impose it on the, the CT picture. And so what you can do if you do a simple um, geometry minimization of the, the H and E slice matched for blood vessels and airways is you can precisely position that histopathology on the bit of radiology that you're looking at. And so now you're starting to get the title that I gave it, radio histopathology, because you can start to see in the end, if we can infer what that pathology looks like by looking at these animal samples, we can then start to talk about what's the actual histology present in patients where we don't have the option of cutting out the lung and looking at the histopathology per se. And more than that, we can start to trace back the behavior of these individual lesions. 
And so here, for instance, are two lesions, and I, I like this pair because clearly they're at sort of different states when you're, when you're starting here. One of them is clearly resolving or starting to resolve and doesn't respond uh, to chemotherapy at all, and the other one does, and they're two right next to each other. And you can superimpose the pathology on that, and you can see where the other section is, and then you can see where they both are in the histopathology. And so now, developing the quantitative um, assessment of what cells are there, what cell types, how much casium, how much necrosis, how much error is actually present, you can start to talk about quantitative features of the lesions that actually correlate with long-term response. And you can do that at the whole lung level, and I've just pasted on a bunch of um, H&E stains of those. And now, let's go back to this very complex picture of what happened in this animal. And I want to show you what the pattern is, because it took me a ridiculously long amount of time to figure this out, but I think we did, in the end, uh, figure it out. And the difference is, all of the lesions that fail to respond to treatment were already peaking and very highly inflamed uh, 30 days post-infection. Remember, the animal's not treated until day 55, so there's no treatment until here. And so these are the lesions where there's the most inflammation that's happening early, one month after they've been infected. And none of these respond to treatment. Not, not one single one of them responds to treatment. Whereas the lesions that were not very inflamed and not really the subject of much immunologic action at the time, uh, 30 days post-infection, despite what they looked like at 55 days, because the pattern doesn't hold there, all of these respond um, to treatment. And that's reflected in the histology, because in the end, when you look at the histology, the difference in lesions that respond and lesions that don't respond is the presence of necrotic material of casium, essentially, in those lesions. And so there's a history. And so I like, I talk about these in terms of age. I'm, I'm uncomfortable with the notion of age, but, I, but it's the only thing I can think of at the moment. These are immunologically more mature, so they're older lesions. And so the hotter a lesion is pre-treatments uh, or early post-infection, the less, the more difficult this is gonna be to treat over time. And these are younger lesions because they're just barely visible um, early in infection, and yet those lesions really haven't had time uh, to produce the casium and to produce the foamy macrophages and everything else that goes into consolidating a TB lesion and creating that necrotic granuloma that we're familiar with, those, those ones are still very susceptible to TB chemotherapy. And of course, I explained to you before the outlier lesion to this, which is this um, different, uh, fundamental different pathology, which is an inflammatory um, consolidative um, lesion. And so, okay, that's interesting and it's nice, but it's in monkeys. Why is that really important and why should you care about it? And one of the reasons you should care about it is, um, is uh, because I think it, it spills back to everything we study in the laboratory and understanding how lesions form and what lesions are actually relevant for looking at TB chemotherapy. But the other reason you should care about it is because we still have to match this to something that happens in patients. And, I'm gonna tell you about two studies um, just to show you how we're using that and how we're trying to think about it that are ongoing and where I don't have complete data sets, but I wanna share with you what we've seen so far. Um, and the first is something we're calling the next-gen EBA study. Now, you may not be familiar with EBA studies, but this is a mandatory standard practice for a new TB drug. You enroll patients as inpatients in a hospital, you give them monotherapy for two weeks, and you take daily cultures from them, and you quantitate how many bacteria are present in their sputum, and you monitor the rate of decline in the patient's sputum over that two-week period of time. At the end of that two weeks, you slam them with all four drugs, and you check them out and, and let them wander off. And that's considered ethical to do. In fact, it's mandatory according to um, FDA uh, and EMA rules that the first thing you do when you expose TB patients to a new drug is you do an EBA study. Despite that, it's usually negative. In fact, for a couple of notable recent examples like bedaquiline and delaminid, you really had to torture the data to see any signal presence at all in those. And the EBA study almost killed the drug before the drug was present, was able to be validated in a longer term study. And the reason is because it doesn't usually tell you what the utility of the drug is in terms of sterilizing activity in patients. And so what we decided to do was, okay, uh, after 10 years of, of complaining about EBA studies and criticizing them, I said, we gotta find a way to make this better because I'm never gonna stop people from doing it, so we've gotta make it better. And so what we did was essentially take a conventional EBA study and bookend it with PET CT scans and look at quantitative changes in the radiology over two weeks. And again, we were informed by the monkeys because in the monkeys, we knew we could see changes at two weeks and nobody had ever done it in people and people were pretty skeptical we would see changes in two weeks. 
And so what we decided to do was to enroll um, 160 drug-naive uh, smear-positive patients with TB, and this is in Cape Town um, with Andreas Diakon, who's sort of the guru of um, EBA studies. Um, into eight different treatment arms. And the treatment arms are very bog standard things, right? This is INH, RIF, PZA, um, moxifloxacin, RIF and PZA, INH and PZA, and then the standard four drug treatment. And then the four drug regimen that was used in the REMOX trial that failed uh, in the phase three that I showed you um, earlier. And what we wanted to do then was randomly assign them to those, look at on a lesion by lesion basis, the way I've been showing you in the, pay, in the monkeys, what the impact of each of these drugs was, and see if we couldn't rationalize the results we saw in terms of the impact on specific types of lesions. Okay, like I said, this is a study in progress. Um, we have, uh, to date, um, randomized 121 of the 160 patients, and 105 of them have completed the study. Um, I am blind to which arms people are on, so I can't actually show you any of the, 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 the data analysis doesn't make any sense until we break the blind and the data is locked, right? So what I'm gonna show you instead is a couple of examples of, of the kinds of changes that we're seeing uh, in patients. And the first thing that you'll um, realize is that TB in people is considerably more complex even than TB in monkeys. Um, but here's one example of a patient who is on the top um, at the time he enters the study, the day before he's taken his first dose of whatever combination or single drug regimen he's on. And I'm gonna show you the sort of um, axial slice through here. Um, the sagittal slice you know, down the middle or the coronal slice here. And I've circled two, two sets of lesions here, one in green, uh, and this is the same. The, these lesions are the same, right? This is just different slices showing you different representations of what that lesion looks like, and one in red. And what you'll notice is that the one in green gets noticeably better in terms of the SUV, and you can integrate that by eye. I could tell you the numbers, but it won't be meaningful. Um, it gets noticeably better in that two-week period of time. At the same time, in that same patient, just like in the monkeys, there's this pesky lesion in red that starts out looking like this, but in that same two-week period of time, gets noticeably worse in that patient. And it just reinforces the, the idea that TB, you know, it's, this is not a systemic infection. This is a local infection of multiple sites in the lung, each one of which behaves separately and independently of everybody else. And the starting characteristics of this lesion, something about that predispose it to continue to develop into a lesion, whereas the starting characteristics of this lesion predispose it to be sensitive to whichever of those combination arms that it's on. I could show you patient after patient, but this is the rule. This is not the exception. This is the way that animals, particularly primates, with complex lesions that are asynchronous, with different ages, immunologic ages now, behave in patients with tuberculosis. Okay, so that's one study that um, we should finish by um, August of this year and data analysis and report out by the end of this year. The other study I wanna tell you about is a, is a different way to use that same kind of information called PREDICT. Um, and this is, um, this is a trial that's essentially trying to use what we've learned in the, the monkeys and in the, in the, the, the human trials to stop people, to identify that 80% of people that are treated by four months of chemotherapy. And so I've told you some of this before. Um, we want to shorten treatment. The, the, what, the one thing I wanna highlight here is that this exact kind of design has been tried before. In fact, the TBRU about 10 years ago tried to do this um, by taking patients who had no cavity on their baseline chest X-ray, who were sputum culture negative by month two, and randomly assigning them to stop after four months or to continue to six months of treatment, figuring that they could identify those patients at high risk. And they were stopped early by their data safety, data safety and monitoring board because the arm that was stopping at four months was unacceptably high, had an unacceptably high relapse rate. And so those characteristics alone weren't enough to tell you who the high risk uh, patients were. There was something more that you had to learn about the radiology. And so what we're doing um, is screening patients with a baseline uh, PET CT. Um, based on the data we've acquired so far, we will take off a certain number of those patients as being just where the disease is just too extensive for them to be candidates for um, early discontinuation. The remainder will get a second PET CT um, um, after one month of treatment and then we'll watch their bacteriology after four months of treatment, and at that moment, they'll be randomly assigned to either stop 
or to continue on for two more months of treatment. And then we'll look at how everybody is doing um, after 18 months, after they've had a year post-treatment uh, discontinuation, and that's the primary endpoint um, for the study. This is, uh, this is a pretty large, by my standards, not by Megan's standards, obviously, <laughs> this is a large uh, study, 516 subjects. It's recruiting in five um, sites in China, in uh, Henan province, in five sites in South Africa, uh, in and around the, the Western Cape. Um, and I've just come back from around the world tour, um, sort of doing the study launch for this. So the first patients will be recruited um, this spring uh, into this trial. And if you're interested, these are the early treatment uh, completion criteria, and you see that they're quite specific. I mean, this is no single cavity air volume on CT greater than 30 mils, and the total hard volume of disease has to be less than 200 milliliters, and the total amount of interest. So, so you see what we're trying to do. We're trying to push this towards not necessarily personalized medicine for TB patients, but trying to understand when somebody is actually cured functionally in terms of their immune response well enough um, to, uh, to discontinue them from, from treatment, whatever time point that is. Um, yeah, like I said, this is, this is a big undertaking and this is just the people who are involved uh, in the PREDICT trial as we get um, underway. Uh, we just had our big uh, first uh, inaugural meeting in central China in um, Zhengzhou, uh, which is a, a city in Henan province, where we had a lot of the South African investigators come uh, to China for that initial meeting. And we really think it's important that we're reflecting two very different populations in this, so that any biomarkers that come out of this or any markers of completement of treatment completion aren't just specific for one particular country or one particular region of the world, but they're general for TB patients um, globally. Almost as complicated as the science um, is the funding for this. Um, uh, the, the Gates Foundation has been great in, in coming to the table with uh, part of the funding for that. EDCTP has also funded it, as has my institute. Uh, importantly, so has the Grand Challenges uh, China program and the Ministry of Science and Technology uh, in, in China. And it's, um, it's probably gonna kill me, but it's, uh, it's the biggest, most exciting clinical trial we've ever undertaken. And it's uh, what I like to call the put your money where your mouth is um, trial because Really, we think we understand what a functional cure looks like in TB patients, and this is the test of it. Okay, and so just a few take-homes. Um, if you don't remember anything else from this talk at all, um, remember that individual lesions in a, in a patient or in a monkey, um, not so much in a mouse, um, really have a dynamic trajectory that's determined by the immunologic age and history of that lesion. And so lesions that are, are, are at an older time point, are, you can expect to react differently than lesions that are at a younger time point. These lesion states are not synchronized within animals. Even though we infect them all on the same day, some lesions develop quickly and other lesions don't Develop. I can't say whether those are secondary lesions to the primary infection, but I suspect some of them are, and I suspect some of them just develop more slowly. Um, histopathologically, um, casium, liquefaction, and cavitation are all um, associated with refractory uh, treatment status. That's, that's not a surprise, right? We've known that for years from, the, um, from retrospective analyses of phase three data. Um, and mapping this histopathology to PET CT data will allow us to actually do what I said I was going to do in the title of my talk, which is do this sort of virtual uh, bronchoscopies in patients to type lesions a little more accurately. So with that, I will stop and take questions. Not, not from Eric, though. <laughs> Do you think that the, the fact that the caseating lesions are refractory to treatment is about access, or is it about the metabolic state of the bacteria in those lesions? And can you address that in your marmoset model? Um, yes and yes. Um, <laughs> that's the simple, so I, I picked linazolid as the, the example to show you because really that's the example, that's the drug where we've done uh, lesion penetration studies with Veronique Tartois where we're, we're pretty confident that the concentration of the casium reflects I, the concentration in the serum. So we know that the PK, the drug gets into casium very well, but it comes out of casium really easily. And so it's really reflecting what's happening in the... Um, in the serum concentrations. That's not always true with other drugs. There are definitely drugs that accumulate in casium. Rifampicin is a good example of that. And so you, know, you can't separate those two things, right? Access and exposure to the drug is gonna influence the rate of kill um, of it. And casium definitely changes the whole architecture of what's happening in the lung around those bugs. <laughs> 
Yeah. So it's kind of a follow-up to what you were just saying. I was wondering if you've looked at any other markers for other aspects of the state of the lesion. Uh, so for example, things that have been used in the cancer world to look at tumor hypoxia. I mean, we've done, so we've done sort of markers like pimenidazole in the monkeys to show when lesions are hypoxic, as have many other groups at this point. And somebody's done that in patients with using a fluorinated mesonidazole, which has been used in oncology to mark hypoxia. So I think the evidence is pretty solid that if there's casium, the lesion is hypoxic. Um, and I, I think we're on pretty good ground with that. We didn't do that in these particular animals in a real-time way. And I think the more interesting readout that somebody's going to ask me, so I'll just upfront it, is the triolose incorporation. So what's the metabolic state of the bacteria? And we haven't done that in this, this sort of very detailed way that's in progress now um, with FDG to staining. Eric. <laughs> um, so the... What you get out of the um, PET CDs is very complex, and you've measured a number of different um, uh, descriptors of what you're seeing. So, is it as you're doing these, as you're doing both the the, uh, the large uh, failure trial and the EBA trials, um, is there a kind of fluid way of defining what an endpoint is going to be? Are you going to are you going to let that kind of ride and figure out what it is as you go along? Because it's very difficult to do a clinical trial without predefining it, but I'm not sure you know which of the many criteria you can measure are going to be the most predictive yet. Yeah, so you should read our data analysis plan for the next-gen trial. I mean, you're right. I mean, we did pre-specify literally everything we could measure as potentially testable against the endpoint. And, you know, we'll take the hit on the multiple comparisons. That, that, that's fine. This is really about learning what kinds of lesions respond to what kind of drugs in the EBA trial. You know, we got around that with the PREDICT study by accepting the endpoint as the hard endpoint of relapse. So if more patients relapse in the four-month arm than in the six-month arm, then we'll join the historical dustbin of people who've tried to shorten therapy to four months and failed. But I don't think that's going to happen. Knock on wood. <laughs> Hi, all the, all the way in the back, back here. Hi. Um, so Gila mentioned this in her talk, too, about using host-directed therapeutics to try and help augment some of the chemotherapies we currently have. And it looked like from the one example that you gave that the more inflammation led to most less re resolving. Do you think by using a host-directed therapeutic where you could kind of normalize across all of those lesions would help in resolving TB infection? Yeah, well, I, let, me, let me go one step further than that. I mean, I think actually we see multiple examples in patients and in non-human primates where treatment leads to additional pathology, right? Treatment often will lead to formation of a cavity where there wasn't a cavity before, or more inflammation and more fibrosis. And so I think the mechanism by which you treat might also impact if, so if you could administer a host-directed therapy that's suppressed, that inflammation that happens as a result of treatment. I mean, you can imagine when you treat with something like isoniazid and the bacteria spills its guts all over the place that you create this little micro-inflammatory environment that's probably damaging to your long-term ability to sterilize the bugs. I think that's exactly what happens. So that's at least my rationalization for where I see the host-directed therapy as playing a big role as in avoiding treatment-induced uh, pathology that limits sterilizing. If an alternative live animal imaging method allowed you to be able to detect and measure your choice of small molecules or proteins, what small molecules or proteins would you want to detect? <laughs> yeah, I, so I'm probably cholesterol. That's a pretty big ask, but I mean, that's probably the, the thing that's a hallmark for caseation that would be useful. People have looked at lots of, and we've talked about lots of different things. I mean, bacterial metabolic status, I didn't show this today, and inflammatory response seem to be inversely associated in these lesions. So if the immune system is seeing it, they're suppressing the bacteria pretty effectively. And if the bacteria are growing, the immune system's not seeing it very much. And so I, I really like the bacteria-centric probes, but I think uh, there are so few bacteria presence, that seeing them in human lesions is really going to be a challenge. And so I'd focused on host molecules that make up the altered pathology that we're looking at. Okay, cool. <laughs> <laughs>